Number five. Listen to a short conversation, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have twenty seconds to prepare and sixty seconds to record your answer. Now listen to a conversation between a student and her friend. I need to earn some extra money. My budget's just out of control. I hear you. I had the same problem last semester. So what'd you do? I got a job at the cafeteria. I don't really like the work, but the good thing is that you get free meals. Really? Are they hiring? I don't know, but I could ask. The pay isn't great, though. See, the meals are the thing. Oh, still, that would cut down on the grocery bill. Yeah, or you know what? You could rent that extra room in your apartment. I'll bet you could get two hundred and fifty dollars a month at least. I've been thinking about that. It would help with the rent and the utilities, and I wouldn't have to work, so I could use my time for my classes. But I keep thinking, what if my roommate doesn't pay on time, or what if there's a lot of noise? Well, you'd have to have a deposit and a contract, something in writing, so you could keep the deposit if there were problems, and you could break the contract if it didn't work out. Describe the woman's problem and the two suggestions that her friend makes about how to handle it. What do you think the woman should do, and why? Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number six. Listen to part of a lecture, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have twenty seconds to prepare and sixty seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in a sociology class. The professor is discussing the criteria for using older research references. Well. First of all, you have to understand that there's no hard and fast rule for deciding when a research reference is too old, but that doesn't help you much. So, I'll try to give you a couple of guidelines, and then you'll just have to use good judgment. Okay, let's just say for our purposes that the research is thirty years old. Then the next thing to think about is whether any changes have occurred in society to call the data into question. For example. In a study that looks at diet, we know logically that many changes have occurred in eating patterns over the past thirty years, so this study would probably be out of date. But a study of,、uh, say, language development may be okay because the way that babies learn their native language hasn't changed much in the same period of time. So what I'm saying is, the date is less important than the potential for change. Okay, then the second criteria to consider is whether the citation is a finding or an opinion. If you have a study that indicates,、uh, for example, that college students are drinking more, that's a finding. But if you have a statement by the researcher that drinking is the most serious problem on campus, then you have an opinion. And opinions are accurate over the years as long as they're attributed to the person and the dates cited. But the finding for an older study may be too old. In that case, it's probably better to use a more recent study.
Using the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the two criteria for using an older research reference presented by the professor. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Model Test 2, Writing Section. First, read the passage on page 199 and take notes. Now listen to a lecture on the same topic as the passage that you have just read. Philosopher John Searle has challenged the validity of the Turing test because it's premised on behavior rather than on thought. To prove his argument, he suggested a paradox, which he refers to as the Chinese Room. If a monolingual English-speaking person receives questions on a computer terminal from a Chinese person in another room, naturally, the English-speaking person won't understand the questions. However, if there's a large reference that can be accessed, and if the reference is detailed and comprehensible, then the English speaker could conceivably break the code. For example, if a sequence of Chinese characters are received, the reference could indicate which sequence of Chinese characters would be expected in response. In other words, the behavior would be correct, although the English speaker wouldn't be thinking at a level that included meaning. The person would be manipulating symbols without understanding them, or as Searle suggests, the person would be acting intelligent without being intelligent, which is exactly what a computer could be programmed to do. Therefore, at least theoretically, a computer could be designed with complex input that would allow it to provide adequate behavioral output without being aware of what it's doing. If so, then it could pass the Turing test. But the test itself would be meaningless because it doesn't really answer the most basic question about artificial intelligence, which is, can the computer think? Model Test 2. Example Answers. Example answer for independent speaking question one, a birthday. In my country, birthdays are celebrated every year, but the most important birthday for a young girl is the quinceañera, the birthday when she's 15. This is celebrated with a church service. The girl wears a white dress, kind of like a wedding dress, and several attendants accompany her to the altar where the priest talks with her about becoming an adult woman. After the service, the whole family celebrates with friends, and there's music and dancing and food. Traditionally, only relatives and close friends are invited to the church service, but many more people attend the party afterward. Um, in the old days, the ceremony presented the girl to society for marriage proposals, but now she's considered the appropriate age to begin dating. Example answer for independent speaking question two, course requirements. I prefer to write a paper instead of taking a test because I know exactly what the topic is when I'm researching a paper, but there are a large number of possibilities for questions on a test, and that makes it much more difficult to prepare for. Besides, in my experience, some teachers aren't very straightforward about their tests, and even though I've studied and understand the subject, well, 
Sometimes the questions that you'd expect to see aren't on the test, and some obscure information is tested instead. But probably the most important reason for my preference is that I get very nervous when I'm taking a test, and that can affect my performance. Writing a paper doesn't cause me the same level of anxiety. Example answer for Integrated Speaking Question 3, Health Insurance. The foreign student advisor agrees with the policy that requires international students to purchase health insurance from the university at registration. He assures students that the university isn't trying to increase fees for international students by doing this. He explains that health care is very expensive. For example, a visit to the emergency room can be a financial burden to a family who doesn't have medical insurance. He says that most families of international students don't expect the cost to be so excessive. And the reason that the university doesn't allow students to substitute other health care providers is because the local medical community has had problems with validation for health insurance plans from abroad and now refuses to accept them. So, um, in order to protect the students, the school doesn't make any exceptions to the policy. Example answer for integrated speaking question 4. Antarctica. Many countries have staked claims in Antarctica because the natural resources in other areas are being depleted, and, uh, research indicates that minerals, fuels, and even some sources of protein are probably under the ice in large quantities. So, the implication is that as raw materials are exploited in areas that are relatively easy to reach, nations will think about taking advantage of their claims. For the time being, the location and climate have discouraged exploitation, and so have the treaties that protect the environment and encourage scientists to collaborate. It's also worth mentioning that Antarctica's vitally important to the balance that's maintained in the environment worldwide. So, in addition to all the difficulties that would have to be overcome to take advantage of the resources in their claims, individual nations also recognize the danger to the global environment and, at least for now, they're not pursuing their national interests. Example answer for integrated speaking question 5. Extra money. The woman needs additional income to meet her expenses, so her friend suggests that she get a job at the cafeteria. Even though the salary isn't very high, the free meals are helpful. He isn't sure whether there's a job available, but he agrees to find out. He also recommends that she rent the second bedroom in her apartment for a minimum of $250 a month, which would subsidize the rent and utilities. The problem she points out is that roommates can be disruptive and sometimes they aren't financially responsible. But she'd have more time to study if she didn't have to work, and her friend reminds her that she could require an agreement in writing, along with a deposit. Okay, in my opinion, she should try to get a job either in the cafeteria or someplace else on campus because if she lives alone, she can maintain a quiet environment for study, and she won't have to worry about a contract that could be difficult to enforce. Example answer for Integrated Speaking Question 6. Research References. According to the lecturer, there are two major criteria for using an older research reference. First, she mentions, and I'm quoting here, the potential for change. For example, research on diet may be too old after 30 years because many changes have occurred in dietary practices during that time. But research on language development may be okay because fewer changes have taken place in language acquisition in the same number of years. The other criteria requires that you first identify the research as a conclusion or an opinion because, uh, in general, a conclusion may be outdated when a newer study is published, but an opinion credited to a person with the date of the opinion in the citation, um, that's correct over time. In other words, there's no exact number of years to decide whether a reference is acceptable, so the date isn't as significant as the criteria. So. An older study can be used if changes in the research haven't taken place or if the results are worded as opinions with the dates cited. Review Listening Section Problems 15 to 18 Conversation Listen to a conversation on campus between two students. Wait up! 
I need to ask you about something. Oh, hi, Jack. Hi. Listen, I was just wondering whether you understood what Professor Carson was saying about the review session next Monday. Sure. Why? Well, the way I get it, it's optional. Right. He said if we didn't have any questions, we should just use the time to study on our own. Okay, that's what I thought. Maybe I'll just skip it then. Well, it's up to you. But the thing is, sometimes at a review session, someone else will ask a question, and, you know, the, the way the professor explains it, it's really helpful. I mean, to figure out what he wants on the test. Oh, I didn't think about it that way. But it makes sense. So you're going to go then? Absolutely. Um... I've had a couple other classes with Carson, and the review sessions always helped get me organized for the test. Oh. And if you've missed any of the lectures, he usually has extra handouts from all the classes, so... Well, I haven't missed any of the sessions. Me neither. But I'm still going to be there. Look, uh, if it's like the other review sessions, the first hour he's going to go over the main points for each class. Kind of like an outline of the course. Then from 5.30 to 6.30 he'll take questions. That's the best part. In the last half hour, he'll stay for individual conferences with people who need extra help. I usually don't stay for that. Okay, so we just show up at the regular time and place for class? Or not, if you decide to study on your own. Right. But don't you think he'll notice who's there? He said he wasn't going to take attendance. Yeah, but still. It's a fairly large class. But if he's grading your final and he remembers you were at the review, it might make a difference. Maybe. I think the important thing is just to study really hard and do your best. But the review sessions help me study. I think they're really good. Okay, thanks. I guess I'll go too. So I'll see you there. Yeah, I think I, I'd better go. 1. Why does the man want to talk with the woman? 2. Why does the woman think that the review session will be helpful? 3. Why does the man decide to go to the review session? 4. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the following question. He said he wasn't going to take attendance. Yeah, but still. It's a fairly large class. Why does the man say this? Yeah, but still. Review, listening section, Problems 19 to 24. Lecture. Listen to part of a lecture in a zoology class. As you know from the textbook, mimicry isn't limited to insects, but it's most common among them, and by mimicry I'm referring to the likeness between two insects that aren't closely related but look very much alike. The insects that engage in mimicry are usually very brightly colored. One of the insects, the one that's characterized by an unpleasant taste, a bad smell, a sting or bite, that insect's called the model. The mimic looks like the model but doesn't share the characteristic that protects the model from predators. But of course, the predators associate the color pattern or some other trait with the unpleasant characteristic and leave both insects alone. Henry Bates was one of the first naturalists who noticed that some butterflies that closely resemble each other were actually unrelated. So mimicry, in which one species copies another, is called Batesian mimicry. I have some lab specimens of a few common mimics in the cases here in the front of the room, and I want you to have a chance to look at them before the end of the class. There's a day-flying moth with brown and white and yellow markings. And this moth's the model because it has a very unpleasant taste and tends to be avoided by moth eaters. But you'll notice that the swallowtail butterfly mounted beside it has very similar coloration. And actually, the swallowtail doesn't have the unpleasant taste at all. 
Another example is the monarch butterfly, which is probably more familiar to you since they pass through this area when they're migrating. But you may not know that they have a very nasty taste because I seriously doubt that any of you have eaten one. But for the predators who do eat butterflies, this orange and black pattern on the monarchs, a warning signal not to sample it. So the viceroy butterfly here is a mimic. Same type of coloring, but no nasty taste. Nevertheless, the viceroy isn't bothered by predators either because it's mistaken for the monarch. So how does a predator know that the day-flying moth and the monarch aren't good to eat? Well, a bird only has to eat one to start avoiding them all, models and mimics. A stinging bumblebee is another model insect. The sting's painful and occasionally even fatal for predators, so there are a large number of mimics. For example, there's a beetle that mimics bumblebees by beating its wings to make noise. And the astonishing thing is that it's able to do this at the same rate as the bumblebee, so exactly the same buzzing sounds created. I don't have a specimen of that beetle, but I do have a specimen of the hoverfly, which is a mimic of the honeybee. And it makes a similar buzzing sound, too. When you compare the bee with the fly, you'll notice that the honeybee has two sets of wings, and the hoverfly has only one set of wings. But as you can imagine, the noise and the more or less similar body and color will keep most predators from approaching closely enough to count the wings. Some insects without stingers have body parts that mimic the sharp stinger of wasps or bees. Although the hawk moth is harmless, it has a bundle of hairs that protrudes from the rear of its body. The actual purpose of these hairs is to spread scent, but to predators, the bundle mimics a stinger closely enough to keep them away, especially if the hawk moth is moving in a threatening way as if it were about to sting. There's a hawk moth here in the case, and to me at least, it doesn't look that much like the wasp mounted beside it. But remember, when you're looking at a specimen, it's stationary. And in nature, the movement's also part of the mimicry. Oh, here's a specimen of an ant, and this is interesting. Another naturalist, Fritz Mueller, hypothesized that similarity among a large number of species could help protect all of them. Here's what he meant. After a few battles with a stinging or biting ant, especially when the entire colony comes to the aid of the ant being attacked, a predator will learn to avoid ants, even those that don't sting or bite, because they all look alike and the predator associates the bad experience with the group. And by extension, the predator will also avoid insects that mimic ants, like harmless beetles and spiders. Mm, look at this. I have a drawing of a specimen of a stinging ant, beside a specimen of a brownish spider, and the front legs of the spider are mounted so they look more like antennae because that's just what the spider does to mimic an ant. That way it appears to have six legs like an ant instead of eight like a spider. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left and I want you to take this opportunity to look at the specimen cases here in the front of the room. I'll be available for questions if you have them. How about forming two lines on either side of the cases, so more of you can see at the same time? 5. What is the lecture mainly about? Six. How does the professor organize the lecture? Seven. According to the lecture, what are some characteristics of a model? Eight. How does the professor explain Batesian mimicry? Nine. In the lecture, the professor explains Fritz Mueller's hypothesis. Indicate whether each of the following supports the hypothesis. Click in the correct box for each choice. Ten. 
indicate whether each insect below refers to a model or a mimic. Click in the correct box for each phrase. Quiz. Listening section. This is a quiz for the listening section of the Next Generation TOEFL. This section tests your ability to understand campus conversations and academic lectures. During the quiz, you will listen to one conversation and one lecture. You will hear each conversation or lecture one time and respond to 12 questions about them. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to answer the questions. Once you begin, do not pause the audio. Questions 1 to 4. Conversation. Listen to a conversation on campus between a professor and a student. Hi, Professor Taylor. Hi, Jack. I was hoping that I could talk with you for a few minutes. It's about the test. Oh, okay. Well, I've never taken an open book test, and I just don't know what to expect. Does that mean I can use my book during the test as a reference? Exactly. And you can use your notes in the handouts, too. Really? Yes, but Jack, since you've never taken an open book test, I should warn you, it isn't as easy as it seems. Because? Because you don't have enough time to look up every answer and still finish the test. Oh. That's the mistake that most students make. You see, the purpose of an open book test is to allow you to look up a detail or make a citation. But the students who are looking up every answer spend too much time on the first few questions, and then they have to leave some of the questions at the end blank. So it's important to pace yourself. It is. The test's one hour long, and there are 20 questions, so you have to be working on question 10 in half an hour. Right. That's clear enough. So, how do I prepare for an open book test? Well, the first thing to do is to organize your notes into subject categories so you can refer easily to topics that might appear in the test questions. And then study your book, just like you would for any other test. Well, some people mark passages in the book with flags to make it easier to locate certain facts. But other than that, just prepare for a test like you usually do. Right. Um, uh, Professor Taylor, could I ask you, um, why are you making this test open book? I mean, we have to study for it like always, so I hope you don't mind that I asked. I'm, I'm just curious. I don't mind at all, Jack. I think an open book test provides an opportunity for real learning. Too many of my students use to memorize small facts for a test and then forget all about the broad concepts. I want you to study the concepts so you'll leave my class with a general perspective that you won't forget. Wow, I can relate to that. Most people can. But the way I see it, this is a psychology class, not a memory class. Well, thanks for taking the time to explain everything, Dr. Taylor. You're welcome, Jack. See you next week, then. Okay. Have a nice weekend. You too. 1. Why does the man go to see his professor? Two. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the following question. Yes, but Jack, since you've never taken an open book test, I should warn you, it isn't as easy as it seems. Because... Because you don't have enough time to look up every answer and still finish the test. Why does the student say this? Because... Three. How should Jack prepare for the test? Four. Why does the professor give open book tests?
Questions 5 through 14. Lecture. Listen to part of a lecture in an economics class. The professor is talking about supply side economics. The fundamental concept in supply side economics is that tax cuts will spur economic growth because these tax cuts will allow entrepreneurs to invest their tax savings, thereby creating more jobs and profits. Which ultimately allow the entrepreneur and the additional employees to pay more taxes, even though the rates are lower. Let's go through that again, step by step. First, taxes are lowered. Then, business owners use their tax savings to hire more workers. This increases profits, so the business owner pays more taxes at a lower rate. And in addition, the newly hired workers all pay taxes as well. So there's more income flowing into the government through taxes. Historically, in the United States, several presidents have championed tax cuts to get the economy moving. Although this top-down economic theory is more popular among Republicans who have traditionally been aligned with business interests, in 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a Democratic president, also used tax cuts to improve economic conditions. He probably wouldn't qualify as a true supply sider, but he did understand and capitalize on the basic concept. But it's perhaps Ronald Reagan who's most closely associated with supply side economics, so much so that his policies in the 1980s were referred to as Reaganomics. During his term of office, Reagan cut taxes, but Actually, the huge increases in spending, especially for the military budget, caused supply siders to debate with their conservative cousins. You see, conservative and supply side are not the same thing. Traditional conservative economists insist that tax cuts should be accompanied by fiscal responsibility, that is, spending cuts by government. But supply side economists aren't concerned with spending. They rely on tax cuts to do the job. Period. Back to the supply side policies under Reagan. Well, the supply siders believed that the economic growth resulting from tax cuts would be so great and the total increase in taxes so high that the United States economy would grow beyond its deficit spending. When this didn't happen, some economists distanced themselves from the label supply side while advocating tax cuts with greater attention to spending. Even Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate and an influential member of the Chicago School of Economics, even Friedman's now pointing out that the problem is how to hold down government spending, which accounts for about half of the national income. But he still looks to tax cuts as a solution. So, a more recent problem for supply siders, in addition to the fiscal responsibility issue, is that corporate business tends to move their investment and jobs overseas, which critics say eventually will lead to high unemployment in the United States. But Friedman insists that by moving jobs abroad, incomes and dollars are created that sooner or later will be used to purchase goods that are made in the United States and produce jobs. In the United States, it's supply-side economics with a global perspective. In fact, conservatives and supply-siders alike argue that progress in the American economy has been made from technological changes and increased productivity, producing different goods or more goods with fewer workers. Dr. Barry Asmus cites the example of the millions of tons of copper wire that had to be produced for us to communicate by telephone across country. Now, a few satellites will do the job. Clearly, the people who were employed in the copper wire industry suffered unemployment when the change in technology occurred. Or another example: in the case of manufacturing, 30 years ago. A General Electric plant required 3,000 workers to produce one dishwasher every minute. Now the same plant needs 300 people to produce one dishwasher every six seconds. So you might focus on the fact that many workers will be without jobs making dishwashers, but what do you suppose supply siders would say? Think this through. They'd counter with the argument that the dishwasher will be cheaper as a result of the increased productivity, 
so more people can buy dishwashers and still have some money left. Again, Asmus reasons that if the consumers spend money on more goods, they create jobs because workers are needed to produce the goods they buy. If they invest their money, they also create more jobs by supporting the economy. So, some people do lose jobs because of technology, productivity, and the shift of manufacturing overseas, and only 70% find better paying jobs when they transition to another job. Yes, that's true, and it's a personally painful transition for those involved. But the argument by supply-siders and many conservatives as well is that this is temporary unemployment, and the important word here is temporary. So, the temporary unemployment occurs in the process of shifting people not just from one job to another, but from one segment of the economy to another. To use an analogy, it would be like the shift from farming to manufacturing that's occurred worldwide as better methods allowed fewer farmers to produce food and resulted in the movement of farmers from the country to the cities where they became employed in manufacturing. And now there's a shift from manufacturing to technology, which, if supply-siders and conservative economists are to be believed, will result in an even higher standard of living in the United States and globally. But, of course, the success of the United States within the global economy will largely depend on a favorable balance of trade. How much we can produce in this country, in the new segments of the economy, and how much we can sell abroad. 5. What is the lecture mainly about? Six. How does the professor organize the lecture? Seven. According to the lecturer, what did Kennedy and Reagan have in common? Eight. What would Milton Friedman most likely say about moving a manufacturing plant from the United States to a site abroad? Nine. According to Barry Asmus, what are two key ways that consumers contribute to the creation of new jobs? Ten. How does the professor explain the shift from manufacturing to technology? Eleven. Why does the professor mention the General Electric plant? Twelve. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the following question. Now, the same plant needs 300 people to produce one dishwasher every six seconds. So, you might focus on the fact that many workers will be without jobs making dishwashers. But what do you suppose supply-siders would say? Think this through. Why does the professor say this? Think this through. Thirteen. In the lecture, the professor explains supply-side economics. Indicate whether each of the following strategies supports the theory. Fourteen. Put the following events in the correct order. Review, speaking section. Problem 25, 
Example question. Where would you like to study in the United States? Problem 25. Example answer. I'd like to study at a university in Washington, D.C. because I have family in the area. And, and it'd be nice to have them close by so I could visit them on holidays and in case I need advice or help. I've been to Washington several times and I like it there. It's an international city with restaurants and stores where I can buy food and other things from my country while,、uh, while I'm living abroad. And Washington's an exciting place. I've gone on several tours, but I still have many places on my list of sites to see. Also,、um, there are trains to New York and Florida, so I can take advantage of my free time to see other cities.、Um, As for the universities, there are several,、uh, several excellent schools in Washington, and, and I'd probably be accepted at one of them. Problem 26 Example Question Some students live in dormitories on campus, other students live in apartments off campus. Which living situation do you think is better, and why? Problem 26 Example answer. A lot of my friends live off campus, but I think that living in a dormitory is a better situation,、uh, especially for the first year at a new college. Dormitories are structured to provide opportunities for interaction and for making friends. As a foreign student, it would be an advantage to be in a dormitory to practice English with other residents and to find study groups in the dormitory. And dorm students have、uh, less responsibility for meals, laundry, and, and、uh, cleaning, because there are meal plans and services available、uh, as part of the fees. Besides, there's only one check to write, so uh, the book, uh, the bookkeeping, it's a minimal. And the dormitory offers an ideal location near the library and、um, all the recreational facilities. and... And the classroom buildings. Problem 27. Talk. Now listen to a student who is expressing an opinion about the proposal. I understand that a branch campus on the city's west side would be convenient for students who live near the proposed site, and it might attract more local students, but I oppose the plan because it will redirect funds from the main campus where several classroom buildings need repair Hanover Hall, for one. And、uh, a lot of the equipment in the chemistry and physics labs should be replaced. In my lab classes, we don't do some of the experiments because、uh, we don't have enough equipment. And we need more teachers on the main campus. I'd like to see the branch campus funding allocated for teachers' salaries in order to decrease the student teacher ratios. Most of the freshman classes are huge, and there's very little interaction with professors.、Um, a branch campus would be a good addition. But not until some of the problems on the main campus have been taken care of. Problem 27. Example question. The man expresses his opinion of the proposal in the announcement. Report his opinion and explain the reasons he gives for having that opinion. Problem 27. Example answer. The man concedes that the branch campus might be advantageous for students living close to the new location, but he's concerned that the funding for a branch campus will affect funding on main campus for, for important capital improvements such as classroom buildings that are、um, in need of repair.、Um, and equipment in the science labs is getting old, so it needs to be replaced. And he also points out that more teachers are needed for the main campus in order to reduce student teacher ratios, which, which would improve the quality of teaching and the、um, amount of interaction in classes. So the man feels that more attention should be given to the main campus, and funding should be directed to improve the main campus before a branch campus is considered. Problem 28 Lecture. Now listen to a lecture on the same topic. English uses a system of about a dozen word endings to express grammatical meaning, the ing for present time, s for possession and plurality, and、uh, the ed for the past, to mention only a few. But 
How and when do children learn them? Well, in a classic study by Burko in the 1950s, investigators, they elicited a series of forms that required the target endings. For example, a picture was shown of a bird, and, and the investigator identified it by saying, this is a wug. Then the children were shown two similar birds to, um, to elicit the sentence, there are two, and if the children completed the sentence by saying wugs, well, then it was inferred that they had learned the S ending. Okay. Essential to that study was the use of nonsense words like wug, since the manipulation of the endings could have been supported by words that the children had, had already heard. In any case, charts were developed to demonstrate the, uh, the, the gradual nature of grammatical acquisition. And the performance by children from 18 months to four years confirmed the basic theory of child language, that the, uh, the gradual reduction of grammatical errors, that these are evidence of language acquisition. Problem 28, example question. Describe the WUG experiment and explain why the results supported the basic theory of child language acquisition. Problem 28. Example answer. In English, there are several important word endings that express grammatical relationships. For example, the ED ending signals that the speaker is talking about the past, and the S ending means more than one uh, when it's used at the end of a noun. So when children learn English, they... Um, they make errors in these endings, but they gradually refine their use until they master them. In the WUG experiment, Burko created nonsense words to get children to use endings. So, so the researchers could um, follow their development. It was important not to use real words because the children might have been influenced by a word they'd heard before. So this experiment provided data about the time it takes and the age when endings are learned. It supported the basic theory of child language that um, sorting out grammatical errors is a feature of the speech of, of four-year-olds and a stage in language acquisition. Problem 29, conversation. Did your scholarship check come yet? Yeah, it came last week. Didn't yours? No, that's a problem. And everything's due at the same time. Tuition, my dorm fee, and let's not forget about books. I need about $400 just for books. Well, do you have any money left from last semester? In your checking account, I mean? Some, but not nearly enough. The check probably won't be here until the end of the month, and I won't get paid at work for two more weeks. I don't know what I'm going to do. How about your credit card? Could you use that? Maybe but I'm afraid I'll get the credit card bill before I get the scholarship check, and then I'll be in worse trouble because of, you know, the interest rate for the credit card on top of everything else. I see your point. Still, the check might come before the credit card bill. You might have to gamble, unless... I'm listening. Well, unless you take out a student loan, a short-term loan. They have them set up at the student credit union. Isn't that where you have your checking account? Mm-hmm. So you could take out a short-term loan and pay it off on the day that you get your check. It wouldn't cost that much for interest because it would probably be only a few weeks. That's what I'd do. Problem 29, example question. Describe the woman's budgeting problem and the two suggestions that the man makes. What do you think the woman should do and why? Problem 29, example answer. The woman doesn't have enough money for her expenses. Um, she has to pay tuition and her dorm fees due at the same time. Besides that, she needs to buy books. So the problem's everything has to be paid now, and she won't get her scholarship check till the end of the month. And she won't get her paycheck for two weeks. Um, the man suggests that she use her credit card because she won't have to pay it off until the end of the month. But the problem is the, the interest would be substantial if the scholarship checks delayed. The other idea, to take out a student loan, that seems better because the loan could be paid off on the day the check arrives, instead of a fixed date, and it wouldn't cost much to get a short-term loan at the student credit union. So, I support applying for a student loan. 
Problem 30. Lecture. Two types of irrigation methods that are used worldwide are mentioned in your textbook. Flood irrigation. That's been a method in use since ancient times, and we still use it today where water's cheap. Basically, canals connect a water supply like a river or a reservoir to the fields where ditches are constructed with valves, uh, valves that allow farmers to siphon water from the canal, sending it down through the ditches. So that way the field can be totally flooded, or smaller narrow ditches along the rows can be filled with water to irrigate the crop. But this method does have quite a few disadvantages. Like I said, it's contingent upon cheap water because it isn't very efficient and the flooding isn't easy to control. I mean, the rows closer to the canal usually receive much more water, and of course, if the field isn't flat, then the water won't be evenly distributed. Not to mention the cost of building canals and ditches and maintaining the system. So let's consider the alternative, the sprinkler system. In this method of irrigation, it's easier to control the water and more efficient since the water is directed only on the plants. But in hot climates, some of the water can evaporate in the air. Still, the main problem with sprinklers is the expense for installation and maintenance because there's a very complicated pipe system and that usually involves a lot more repair and even replacement of parts. And, of course, we have to factor in the labor costs in feasibility studies for sprinklers. Problem 30, example question. Using examples from the lecture, describe two general types of irrigation systems, then explain the disadvantages of each type. Problem 30, example answered. Two methods of irrigation were discussed in the lecture. First, flood irrigation. It involves the release of water into canals and drainage ditches that flow into the fields. The disadvantages of the flood method, um, well, it isn't very efficient since more water is used in flooding than the crops actually uh, need, and also it isn't easy to control. Another problem is the initial expense for the construction of the canals and the connecting ditches as well as, as maintenance. And besides that, if the fields aren't flat, the water doesn't, I, I mean, it isn't distributed evenly. The second method is sprinkler irrigation, which uses less water and provides better control, but there's some evaporation and the pipe system's complicated and can be expensive to install and maintain. So there's usually a lot more labor cost because the equipment must be repaired and replaced more often than a canal system. Quiz. Speaking section. This is a quiz for the speaking section of the Next Generation TOEFL. This section tests your ability to communicate in English in an academic context. During the quiz, you will respond to six speaking questions. You may take notes as you listen. You may use your notes to answer the questions. The reading passages and the questions are printed in the book, but most of the directions will be spoken. Once you begin, do not pause the audio. Number one. Listen for a question about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you have 15 seconds to prepare and 45 seconds to record your answer. If you were asked to choose one movie that has influenced your thinking, which one would you choose? Why? What was especially impressive about the movie? Use specific reasons and details to explain your choice. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Number two. Listen for a question that asks your opinion about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you have 15 seconds to prepare and 45 seconds to record your answer. Some people think that teachers should be evaluated by the performance of their students on standardized tests at the end of the term. Other people maintain that teachers should be judged by their own performance in the classroom and not by the scores that their students achieve on tests. Which approach do you think is better and why? Use specific reasons and examples to support your opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number three, read a short passage and listen to a talk on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. A meeting is planned to explain the residence requirements for in-state tuition. Read the policy in the college catalog printed on page 251. You have 45 seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now. Now listen to a student who is speaking at the meeting. He is expressing his opinion about the policy. Well, I agree with most of the policy, but what I don't understand is why I have to use my parents' address as my permanent address. This is my third year in a dorm on campus, and I've gone to school every summer, so I've lived in this state for three consecutive years. I don't pay state taxes because I don't earn enough as a full-time student to, uh, to pay taxes but I don't receive support from my parents either. I have a small grant and a student loan that I'm responsible for, and, and I plan to live and work in this state after I graduate. So um, I think students like me should be eligible for a waiver. The student expresses his opinion of the policy for in-state tuition, report his opinion, and explain the reasons that he gives for having that opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Number 4. Read a short passage and listen to a lecture on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now read the passage about communication with primates, printed on page 252. You have 45 seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture in a zoology class. The professor is talking about a primate experiment. Let me tell you about an experiment that didn't turn out quite like the researcher had expected. Dr. Sue Samage Rumbo had been trying to train a chimpanzee to use a keyboard adapted with symbols, but no luck. What is interesting about the experiment is that the chimpanzee's adopted son, Kanzi, also a bonobo chimpanzee, well, Kanzi had been observing the lessons and had acquired a rather impressive vocabulary. After that, Kanzi was not given structured training, but he was taught language while walking through the forest or in other informal settings with his trainers. By six years of age, Kanzi had acquired a vocabulary of more than 200 words and was able to form sentences by combining words with gestures or with other words. So the question is this, should we proceed by trying to teach language to primates in a classroom environment, or should we simply live with them and interact informally like we do with beginning learners of language in our own species? I tend to side with those who elect to support language acquisition in natural settings. Explain the importance of the Kanzi experiment in the context of research on primate communication. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number 5. Listen to a short conversation, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to a conversation between a student and her friend. Did you decide to take Johnson's class? Yeah, I'm going to work it out somehow. Yesterday, I walked from the chemistry lab to Hamilton Hall. That's where Johnson's class is. And? And it took me 20 minutes. Uh-oh. You only have 15 minutes between classes, so that means you'll be five minutes late. Listen, why don't you buy a bike? 
I'm sure you could cut at least five minutes off your time if you took the bike trail. I thought about that, but then I'd have to get a license and I'd have to find somewhere to store it at night. I thought it might be a hassle. Oh, it's not so bad. I have a bike. The license is only $10, and I just park my bike on the deck outside my apartment when the weather's good. And the weather should be okay for most of spring semester. That's true. Well, your other option's to talk with Dr. Johnson. Maybe he'll give you permission to be five minutes late to his class because of the distance from your lab. Actually, I've had several classes with him, and he seems very approachable. Anyway, it's an alternative to the bike, if you don't want to do that. Describe the woman's problem and the two suggestions that her friend makes about how to handle it. What do you think the woman should do, and why? Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number six, listen to part of a lecture, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. The professor is discussing the habitable zone. Of course, stars are too hot to support life. But the light from a star warms orbiting planets or moons, supplying the energy needed for life to develop. Besides energy, a liquid, let's say a chemical solvent of some kind, is also necessary. On Earth, the solvent in which life developed was water. But others, such as ammonia, hydrogen fluoride, or methane might also be appropriate. So, in order for the solvent to remain in liquid form, the planet or moon must lie within a certain range of distances from the star. Why is this so? Well, think about it. If the planet is too close to the star, the solvent will change into a gas, boiling and evaporating. If it's too far from the star, the solvent will freeze, transforming into a solid. For our sun and life as we know it, the habitable zone appears to lie between the orbits of Venus and Mars. Within this range, water remains liquid, and until recently, this area was indeed the accepted scientific definition of the habitable zone for our solar system. But now, scientists have postulated that the habitable zone may be larger than originally supposed. They speculate that the strong gravitational pull caused by larger planets may produce enough energy to heat the cores of orbiting moons. So, that means that these moons may support life. There may be habitable zones far beyond Venus. Using the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the habitable zone, and then explain how the definition has been expanded by modern scientists. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.